the splendor of the king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, in darkness tries to hide, and trembles at at his voice, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, and takes to Good morning, and the Lord be with you. Thank you for joining us this morning as we gather together from home to worship our God. As we begin our time of worship this morning, please join me in prayer. Our great and gracious God, you have called us to this place. We are grateful. You have called us to live together in unity. And we are grateful. You have fulfilled your promises to us, and we are grateful. You have given us a Savior and your Spirit, and we are grateful. Now, from a deep well of gratitude, help us to teach the next generation of your great and glorious deeds. In response to our sin and your salvation, Help us to live lives of service to you. You are merciful and faithful. You are beyond our comprehension. We fail to forgive, yet you sent your Son to save us. Our feet stumble and fall, but you created the very ground that we walk upon. Humbly, we praise you this day and every day. Amen. As we gather together from home to worship this morning, God calls us to worship. The God of creation makes us one in body. Let us join hearts and voices and praise the Lord. The God of Christ 
makes us one in the Spirit, let us join hearts and voices in praise of the Lord. And as God has called us to worship, God himself greets us as well. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue to worship our God together. continue our worship, our God of love and grace invites us into a time of confession. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of confession, and then I'll leave a space open for you to lift your prayers to the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that we are often swept up in the tide of our generation we have failed in our calling to be your holy people, a people set apart for your divine purpose. We live more in apathy, born of fatalism, than in passion, born of hope. 
We are moved more by private ambition than by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits than of service and sacrifice. We try to speak in your name without relinquishing our glories, without nourishing our souls, without relying wholly on your grace. Help us to make room in our hearts and our lives for you. By your Holy Spirit, forgive us, revive us, and reshape us in your image. May the words of our mouths and may the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. As we've just confessed our sins before God, we know that God hears us and God offers us assurance of forgiveness. From 1 Peter, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. People of God, all of us together have received God's mercy in Christ. In Christ we are forgiven, we are redeemed, and we are made to be a community united in faith. Thanks be to God. And now it's time for the children's message. Good morning. And I'm so glad that you could be worshiping with us today. And I'm glad that I can have a few moments to spend with you. Today in church, we're going to talk about a commandment that's in the Ten Commandments. And the commandment we're going to talk about is number four. Do you know what the fourth commandment is? If you know, say to your parents what, what the commandment is. I'll give you a hint if you need some help. The fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day and keep the Sabbath day holy. Now, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the Sabbath day? Well, we read about the Sabbath day in the book of Genesis. Uh, right at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, here's what we read. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So, on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So what is the Sabbath day? The Sabbath day is a day of rest. It's a day where we stop our work 
and where we spend time with our families and where we do other things that we don't get to do normally during the week. Um, one of the things we do on the Sabbath day that's different than any other day in the week is that we come to church and we worship together, like we're doing right now. Now the second question that we have to ask is, what does it mean for the Sabbath day to be holy? Do you know what the word holy means? Well, the word holy simply means set apart. It means to be different, different than other things. In the Bible, we often read God refer to himself as holy, that he is holy. When we read that God is holy, what that means is, is God then is different than anyone else. No one is like God. No one can compare to God. He is set apart. He is perfect in every way. So if, if that's what it means for God to be holy, then what does it mean for the Sabbath day to be holy? It means that the Sabbath day is different than any other day in the week. It's, it's set apart. Um, like the Bible says about God, on six days he did his work, and then on the seventh day he rested. So we too, we do all our work in six days, and then on the seventh day we rest. So that the Sabbath day is distinct from any other day in the week. Like I already said, on the Sabbath day, we come to church and we come and we worship together. That's one of the things that we do. One of the ways that we remember the Sabbath day and that we keep it holy. Now, when I was your age, I didn't really like coming to church that much. Do you know why? Well, my church, my family, we were, uh, we were employed by the church as the janitors, meaning that we, we clean the church. So every single week on Saturday morning, my family went to church and we spent a few hours in the morning cleaning the church, vacuuming the carpets, uh, making sure that the Bibles were in the right places in the pews. I even had to wash the toilets. It was not the best job. Didn't really enjoy it too much, but that's one of the things I had to do. And, and so we, we got the church ready for Sunday worship. But that's not it. On Sunday morning, before anyone else got to church, we had to get there as a family so that we could open the doors and make sure that everything was ready for church to happen that morning. We also had to stay after church until everyone else left so that we could um, lock the, the church. Now, you probably know this because your parents do this, but my parents did the same thing. They like to talk. They like to grab a coffee and, and talk to a lot of people after church. And sometimes it was a really long time after church before we got to go home. So after a while, um, I began to not like going to church too much. After church, for us on Sunday, we would always go to my grandparents. I love doing that. We would always have the exact same lunch. We would always have meatball soup. Um, I'll try my best Dutch here. Chahak uh, balicha um, soup. Soup with meatballs. Loved it. And then after having soup, we would always have a different kind of pie. I loved going to my, my grandparents' place. And it's something that I really miss. I don't get to do that anymore. Um, but that's, that's what Sabbath um, looked like for us. Sunday. We went to church together as a family. We went to my grandparents together. And uh, usually in the afternoons, then I, I got to go on my bike or hang out with some of my friends. Um, the Sabbath day, though, is a day that is different. We do things on Sunday that we don't normally do. And, and that's what the command is all about. Now, the, the real purpose of the Sabbath is, is not only that we get to spend some time resting and spending with, uh, time with family, but the Sabbath is also that we put our focus on God. That this special day is a day to focus on God and show him how grateful we are for, for everything that we have. That's why we come to church on Sunday 
because we, we want to worship God. Uh, that's why we do things together as families on Sunday that we don't normally get to do during the week because it's a special day. And so the, the command that we have is to remember it and to keep it holy because God is holy and God has made the Sabbath day holy, meaning distinct or set apart. And, and so it's important for us to remember that this is a special day because God has made it a special day. All right, at this point, we're going to continue our worship. So I hope that you'll uh, stay and, and join us uh, for the sermon and for some more singing and uh, some praying together. At this point, I'd like to invite you to uh, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Exodus. Uh, we're going to continue reading Exodus chapter 20 together. Uh, we're going to look at the third and the fourth commandment this morning. So as we prepare to read from God's word, please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. And Lord, we pray this morning that as we read from your word, your Holy Spirit would be active in our hearts and our minds. Help us to see your truth, to apply it to our lives. And, and we pray that you would continue to shape and form us as your disciples for your glory and for the building of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to read Exodus chapter 20, the first 17 verses. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning we continue our series called Obedient. And in this series we're looking at the Ten Commandments. And our, our focus is more on being than doing. Recognizing, though, that all of our doing flows from our being. Several years ago, uh, I was spending some time with my dad. And uh, we were talking about Sunday worship and we were talking about preaching. And at this point, uh, I was, I think I was still in college. But anyways, we were, we were talking about preaching and and I was talking about how um, you can use many things in our culture as an illustration um, for, for preaching. I think one of the things that uh, pastors do that is, is good is making cultural connections with the Word of God. And when we were talking about this, my, my dad turned to me and he said, Son, uh, how in the world would you use Batman in a sermon? Well, I didn't really have an answer at the time, um, but I would say, Dad, like this. <laughs> in, 
In the movie Batman Begins, which is the first movie in a trilogy uh, directed by uh, Christopher Nolan, um, Batman Begins tells the story of Bruce Wayne's journey to becoming Batman. In one scene, um, after having left Gotham City for a number of years, uh, Bruce Wayne returns. Um, and, and in this scene, he returns, and he goes out for a night on the town, and he's, he's got a, a beautiful woman with him, and he's, he's flaunting his wealth. And in the middle of this scene, he, he runs into an old childhood friend named Rachel. And, and when he runs into his friend, he's, he's obviously somewhat embarrassed. And then he says to, to Rachel, you know, I... I am more than all of this. All of this is it's not me. There's, there's more to me than this. And then Rachel says something to Bruce that comes to define his journey to becoming Batman and really defines this first movie. She says to him, Bruce, it's not who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you. Say that again. It's not who you are underneath. Rather, it's what you do that defines you. And so what Rachel does is make a connection between our, our being and our doing. Uh, we can identify in uh, any particular way, but if it has no impact in our life, then does it really have any meaning? Uh, apply this to the Christian life, we, we can call ourselves Christians. We can identify as followers of Christ. But if that doesn't manifest itself in our lives, if it, if it isn't displayed somehow, then what value does it have? It's not who we are underneath, but what we do that defines us. So, so in this series called Obedient, uh, we are focused we're focusing on our being, which then is going to manifest in our doing. We're recognizing that there is a deep connection between being and doing. And this connection between being and doing is, in essence, what it means to be a follower of Christ. In the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism, we read this. Here's the answer. I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. So, so if this is who we are, the question then becomes, how is this reality displayed in your life? How is your being displayed in your doing? Last week, we reflected on how Paul uses the, the law. And, and whenever Paul uses the term the law, um, we saw in most cases he's referring to the Ten Commandments. Now, now, if we examine what Paul says about the law, we will come to know that there are two things that the law cannot do. Um, the law cannot justify us. That means the law cannot make us right with God. The reason for this is, is no one can follow the law perfectly. Uh, if, there, if there was an ability in us to carry out the law perfectly, we wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need the cross. But we can't. We can't boast in our ability because we can't follow the law perfectly. And so we are not justified by and through the law. We are justified, made right with God, through our faith in Jesus Christ. 
Paul says in Ephesians 2, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. So the law cannot justify us, but Christ can. The second thing that Paul suggests is that the law cannot sanctify us. Uh, remember, sanctification is the process of our being made like Christ. We, we are not sanctified through the law. We, we are sanctified through the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is both being and becoming. We have been made holy, and yet, by the power of the Spirit, we are being made holy. This is all through Jesus' sacrifice. We have been made holy by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and we are becoming holy through the ongoing work of the Spirit. So the law cannot justify us, and it cannot sanctify us. So, so then the question becomes, what does the law do? We noticed last week that the law rightly orders our affections. Be, because the purpose of the law is to spur us on to love. When summarizing the commandments, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. And so the primary purpose of the law, according to Jesus, is love. That we love God with everything we have and everything we are, and that we love our neighbors as ourselves with everything we have and everything that we are. So while the law cannot justify us and it, and it cannot sanctify us, the law does and it can rightly order our affections. Last week we looked at the first two commandments and we we notice that we are commanded to have no other gods and that we were commanded not to make something from what God has made and worship it as if it was God. God is the primary object of our affection and the only object of our worship. We, we love God more than anything else, and our love for other things is a, a further expression of our love for God. And that doesn't mean that we can't love other things. We, we do love other things, but we love other things insofar as they advance our love for God. Here are a few examples. I, I love my wife. I love my wife so much, yet my love for my wife is an extension of my love for God. Right? God, in his grace, <laughs> gave me the gift of a wife, and in loving her, I'm loving the God who has gifted me with my wife. I, I love my family, and I, I love my family recognizing that God has blessed me with a family that loves me and cares for me. And so my, my loving of my family is an extension of my first love, which is my love for God. Right? So all the things in life that we love are further expressions of our love for God. He is the primary object of our affection and the only object of our worship. And so that brings us to this week. Uh, we're looking at the third and the fourth commandment. Now, you know, here's what I want to suggest this morning. If, if there was a, a thesis, then this is it. The third and fourth command concern God's holiness. And what we do with the third and fourth commandments reflect our understanding of and our response to God's holiness. Because God is a holy God, a God who has invited us to be in relationship with him, we cannot take these commandments lightly. So let's look at the third commandment together. 
This is in verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. The first commandment that we're looking at this morning is quite simple. We are held accountable for how we use the name of God. The text is clear. God will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And this this doesn't mean that if we take God's name in vain, that we cannot be forgiven. That's not what God says in his word. But how we use the name of God reflects our relationship with God. Based on the first and the second commandment, God alone is God, and God is the primary object of our affection and the only object of our worship. And so how we use the name of God matters. Now look at the fourth commandment, starting in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Not only are we accountable for how we use God's name, we are held accountable for how we treat the Sabbath day, which is a day that God has made holy. There's a connection that exists between these two commandments, and I want to focus on that connection with you briefly. The third command reflects how we treat God's name, And the fourth command refers to how we treat the Sabbath day, which is a day that God has made holy. So here's the connection. God is holy, and only God can make something holy. God has made the Sabbath day holy, which means that not only do we honor and revere God's name, we honor and revere him by keeping the Sabbath day holy. Our observance of Sabbath is about maintaining its holiness and giving God the glory that he is due. God's name and the Sabbath concern God's holiness and his glory. Which leads us to the question, what does it mean for something to be holy? Well, the most basic biblical understanding of holiness is for something to be separate or distinct. Regarding God, holiness refers to God's being separate from all that is not God. And God is is incomparable in his perfections. He is infinitely valuable. The Hebrew word for holy is literally translated as to cut or to separate. So so God's holiness is his separateness. It's it's a truth that at the end of the day is, is beyond words. All we can really say is God's holiness means that God is God and that we are not. Here's one example that helps us to understand God's holiness and how we relate to God. In Isaiah chapter 6, we see a vision of God's holiness poured out before uh, Isaiah. Uh, In verses uh, 3 through 5, we read this of Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Isaiah said, Woe to me! I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. 
So Isaiah sees God's holiness, his set-apartness poured out before him. His, his infinite glory, his perfection. And, and what's his response? He, he simply says, woe to me, I am ruined. Why? Because God is incomparable. He is infinitely valuable. His perfections know no end. So Isaiah is overwhelmed in the presence of God. This is what it means to be holy. And I mention this because God is holy, and God alone can make something holy. And both of the commandments that we've just read this morning concern the holiness of God. As people who are created in the image and likeness of God, and people who have been invited into a relationship with God, we are accountable for how we relate to him. The, the first commandment that we've read this morning, it concerns God's name. Now, now I want to make a distinction immediately. God itself is not a name. It's a designation. God's name is not God. God is a, ter is a term that designates the kind of being that God is. Now, in his word, God reveals his name to his people. So here, here are six examples of the names of God. The name Elohim. Elohim, it emphasizes God's power and might. Elion, this refers to God as the one who is exalted. Adonai, refers to God as Lord and Master. El Shaddai, this is the first name of God revealed in the text, revealed to Moses, which essentially means Lord Almighty. Abba, which means Father. And God's covenant name, Yahweh. This is the name revealed to Moses. In Exodus chapter 3, in verse 13 and 14, God is having this conversation with Moses, and, and Moses says to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers sends me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. The I am has sent me to you. This is the covenant name that God reveals to Moses. So whenever you see in your Bibles the word LORD in all capitals, you know that you're seeing Yahweh. This is a proper name for God. This is the covenant name for God. So the first commandment then refers to how we use the name of God or the names of God. We are, we are held accountable for how we use his name. Because the way that we use his name reveals the condition of our hearts in relation to God. The fact that God has given us his name means that we've been invited into relationship with him. And if we've been invited into relationship with God, then we are accountable for how we relate to God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. This is what we're to do with the third command. Bring glory to God by enjoying him. Taking the Lord's name in vain is, is using God's name in an empty or pointless or meaningless way. If we, if we do a word study on vain as it appears in the Bible, um, this is what we would find. Vain refers to emptiness or meaninglessness. There are two implications regarding this. 
Uh, don't use God's name in a way that robs him of glory. Uh, not just that. Encourage others not to use God's name in vain. Uh, we should get upset when we hear other people taking God's name in vain because it violates God's glory. Now, there's a, a TV show that uh, I've been watching um, on Netflix uh, during this social distancing. Um, it's, it's a show called Suits. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, from a story standpoint, it's, it's a pretty compelling show. But there's one thing that uh, just irks me to the core of my being. They, they use the name of God in vain so often. And, and every time I hear it, I, I sort of cringe a little bit. Why? Because they're violating the name of God. They're, they're violating the God that I worship and that I love. And it bothers me when, when someone else makes little of God's name. It should bother us. Because how we treat God's name reveals how we love God and how we relate to him. Here's the second thing that I think this means. Don't bear God's name in an empty fashion. What that means is don't call yourself a Christian. Don't, don't call yourself a Christian that is following God and then represent that falsely. Don't call yourself a Christian and then act as if the gospel has no impact on your life. This too is a breach of the third commandment. I, I can come to Sunday worship, I can, I can call myself a Christian, I can read the Bible here in worship, and I can sing the, the songs and interact with the community, but if, if I leave this place of worship and the, the Bible and, and God has no impact in my life, then I'm not really a Christian, am I? Am I not, not really a follower of Christ? Uh, more than that, I think if we're calling ourselves Christians and followers of Christ out in the community around us, but our actions do not align with the gospel, then we're living falsely. We're falsely representing God, which is a breach of the commandment. We need to take seriously how we represent God. And so if, if you're calling yourself a Christian, let your being and your doing align. Let your being flow into your doing. We respect and honor the name of God because God is holy. Then we have the fourth commandment, which pertains to Sabbath rest. God is holy, which means that God alone can make something holy. And the text tells us that God has made the Sabbath day holy. The, the, the entire basis of this command is that in, in six days, God did all the work of creating. And then on the seventh day, he rested. Because God rested from his work, he commands us too to do all our work in six days and on the seventh day to rest. It's in God's grace and in his providence that he's given us a day to rest because he knows that we need rest. The command to observe Sabbath rest includes three separate commands. Remember the Sabbath day, be mindful of the Sabbath. Be mindful that it's a day of rest. Keep it holy. Right? God alone is holy, and God alone can make something holy. And God has made the Sabbath day holy. And that does not, and that cannot change. The Sabbath day is a holy day. And then third, rest. Because God rested what we find in the Old Testament dispersed throughout the text is a series of commands all related to how to observe Sabbath rest. Now, chapter 35 in Exodus is an entire chapter given to regulations for observing Sabbath rest. 
What I can appreciate about this is that God's people took very seriously the command to observe Sabbath rest. But what we find in the New Testament is that Jesus approaches Sabbath rest differently than the religious leaders of his time. Look at Matthew chapter 12 as an example. So Matthew 12 uh, verses 1 through 12, here's what we read. At the time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, his disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, and yet they're innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here, Jesus referring to himself. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Uh, quoting from the book of Hosea, Jesus says, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any one of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now, there are two things that I, I want to point out here. One, Jesus says that he desires mercy, not sacrifice. And then two, Jesus says that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Which means that Jesus did not come to abolish the Sabbath. Nowhere in the text does Jesus suggest that we no longer observe Sabbath rest and that we don't need a day of rest. What Jesus is doing here is freeing Sabbath rest from legalism. And as the Lord of the Sabbath, he gives it back to us as a blessing from God. The Sabbath day is a, a day for mercy and a day for focusing on and resting in God. How could a day focused on God be anything but a blessing? How could it be a burden? And yet sometimes it feels like Sabbath rest is a burden. Jesus gives us an invitation. He says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers us rest. The Sabbath is not a burden. It is a blessing given to us by a, a gracious God. So let's get practical for a few moments. Is it possible to observe a 24-hour a period where we pull back and where we, we don't work and we focus on God? Is this possible and is this practical? If you're asking me, my answer would be yes, it is possible. And yes, it is practic practical. Not only is it possible, and not only is it practical, it's commanded by God for our good. We live in a fast-paced world where being busy is, is almost a status symbol. We're so busy and we're so scheduled that we, we don't even know how to rest. We don't. I would say, however, that we're in a time right now where 
Um, we're, we're learning to rest in, rest in new ways. We do have more time in a way than we've ever had, um, being socially distant and uh, pulling back from um, the normal of, of life, so to speak. But there are a few things I think we can consider about Sabbath rest. One, accept the gift of one day's rest a week humbly and believe that we need this. We need Sabbath rest. We need a pause from our work so that we can focus on God. In the busyness of life, God can get lost. You know this. Um, if, if you're trying to observe a devotional rhythm, you know that there are times where that rhythm can stop. Why? Because we get busy. And then, you know, going to our Bible and praying can, can seem like a burden rather than a blessing. In the busyness, God can get lost. And, and so we need to accept Sabbath rest as something that we genuinely need, that God gave us for our good. And secondly, secondly uh, the, the point I want to make is devote one day a week to focus your, your attention on God in a special way. Keep the Sabbath day holy to devote yourselves to God and to deepen your love for God. Because when we get too legalistic about the Sabbath, then we become like the Pharisees. And our practices rob us of the joy that Sabbath was intended to provide. When I was in Ontario, the first couple years of ministry, living away from my family, uh, being distant from my friends, um, I met a, a couple in the church that I was serving in that every week gathered for dinner with their family on Sunday evenings. And thankfully, and I'm, I'm so grateful, they invited me to join along. And so every week I, I would um, lead in church and then take my afternoon off and, and I would go in the evening and spend time with this family. And I would be given the gift of, of fellowship and a family dinner and it awakened me again to the blessing of, of pulling back, uh, of sitting together with family, removing distractions, and just focusing on fellowship because doing that advanced my, my love for community, but also, and more importantly, my love for God. I, I think God knew that I, I needed something like that uh, for my flourishing and for my joy. And, and so God gave me that gift, the gift of friendship, the gift of family. And I think God knows that we need rest. We need pauses where we can focus on him and focus on our families and do meaningful things together. But to, to me, I think that's what Sabbath is all about. Um, I, I remember hearing stories from my parents growing up. Uh, you, you couldn't take up the garbage. You couldn't ride your bikes. You couldn't... Uh, the list goes on. There's so many things you couldn't do. Um, that is a little bit too legalistic, I think. Uh, Jesus wants to free the Sabbath from that legalism and simply let it be a day for worshiping God and enjoying God and enjoying fellowship and community. And whatever that looks like, that is good. But the, the key in this is let's pull back from our work. Let's, let's rest as God rested, because we need that. So, by, by way of summary, uh, as we wrap this up this morning, we've now seen four commandments. Um, all four commandments that pertain to our relationship with God. Have no other gods, do not make an idol, do not misuse God's name, and remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. These commandments are about love. Because God is the primary object of our affection and the only object of our worship. Let's continue our worship together this morning. You were the word at the beginning. One
hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silence the most of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you. At this time, we're going to bring our worship service to a close. 
So I, I want to offer you this call for discipleship. People of God, not only in our common worship, but also our daily lives, may we live in obedience to this invitation. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stone, let your stones let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Receive this blessing from our God. May our Lord Jesus Christ, who prayed that we would be one, even as he and the Father are one, so grace you with his spirit that you may grow in grace and fellowship and discover joy in walking together as part of Christ's body so that the world may know that God's love is for us in Christ. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures Father, Son, and Holy